from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today we commence a two-week series on a very, very serious and important topic to all of you, I am sure, and that is the question of nuclear radiation or, and radiation leaks that have been advertised and talked about around the world. We have three guests that will be with us both this week and next week, and I can certainly testify from an earlier uh, performance that they had today on our campus at the time of the taping of this program that they are highly qualified to discuss this issue. In dealing with that, we're going to look at such sites as Hanford and we're going to talk about Three Mile Island uh, uh, back east in Pennsylvania, uh, some things that will happen in Colorado, and a lot of discussion about what used to be the Soviet Union, and particularly in the, now the country of Russia, because all of our guests have visited uh, those sites uh, in Russia, and they have a lot of information to share with you uh, that is very, very important, and we hope you'll be with us both today and again next week. I welcome to the program, as I indicated, three guests. First of all, to my far left is Paul Hateful, who has been a farmer in an area that's been affected by this subject. In fact, for over 45 years, uh, he was in the business of farming, uh, and his family, even prior to that, was involved in the Ritzville and Odessa, Odessa, Washington areas, and he often describes himself as a Hanford downwinder. He and his family have had numerous health problems that he indicates uh, is related to the Hanford nuclear reactor. Mr. Hateful. Thank you for being with us on our campus today and on our program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our second guest is Jane Fritz, and she also comes with uh, very impressive credentials. Her field is journalism, and she has uh, been recognized for her work as a project director, um, executive producer, and writer for public radio, particularly KPBX in Spokane. And as a matter of fact, recently she won uh, the Best Documentary Award from the Inland Northwest Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. And Jane, congratulations on that very deserved award. Uh, she has produced some programs that are going that have uh, aired dealing with what we're talking about today. Uh, she's done some work for the British Broadcasting Corporation and for the Christian Science Monitor Radio. Jane, it's a pleasure having you on our program. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And I'm also very pleased to have what I would consider certainly an outstanding expert in this field is Dr. Bruce Amiston, who is. Uh, the senior staff scientist at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Uh, as a medical doctor, he has a, a very, very uh, important interest in this whole area. He is also the co-investigator of the Hanford Thyroid Disease Study and is on numerous uh, boards of uh, directors around the country and has been interested in particularly in rural health. Uh, we've had some contact with uh, Dr. Amiston before, and it's a pleasure to have you with us and uh, look forward to uh, the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. And, and I also want to say to our viewers as we enter this discussion today uh, that all these guests have had some personal observations of these questions. I'm very pleased to have on our panel today uh, two panel members, both again with expertise in the field we're talking about, and both our colleagues at North Idaho College on our faculty. Uh, to my immediate left is Lloyd Marsh who teaches in the field of chemistry and physics in our natural sciences department. And next to him is Dr. Ken Wright, who teaches in the field of chemistry and also, of course, is in the uh, division of natural science. Uh, I will ask uh, in just a moment Lloyd Marsh uh, to commence our questioning, but I must uh, <coughs> recognize those who have made this program possible with our guest, an organization in North Idaho called Can We, along with the Panel Health and North Central Health, through the Hanford Health uh, Information Project, and I would like to particularly uh, thank uh, them for making this program possible and assisting us in many ways, and Gertie Hansen, who has been the coordinator of putting this together, we thank her. And with that background, I shall ask uh, Lloyd Marsh to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony, and welcome. I guess we could start off the discussion by maybe putting this in context, and I would like uh, Dr. Amundsen to uh, relate your the reason for the trip to Russia and uh, put it in context for us, give us a little introduction and then maybe we can proceed from there. Yes, well, we were contacted in uh, early 1992 by a group of 
uh, physicians, uh, scientists, and uh, local activists in an area called Chelyabinsk. Uh, Chelyabinsk is a uh, city in Russia, uh, in the Russia part of the former USSR. Uh, just as the Hanford nuclear site has been uh, the primary site for weapons-grade plutonium production for our defense establishment over the years, the counterpart in the former Soviet Union was uh, Chelyabinsk, a site about 75 miles from this city of over a million people that's uh, about a thousand miles east of Moscow uh, out into the, the uh, early plains of Siberia. They have had uh, really immense environmental contamination from their weapons production over the years from a series of things that we might talk about later. And the local uh, some political, scientific, healthcare leadership wanted to sponsor a conference to try to, to uh, sort of gain more information uh, about that old experience. And they contacted our chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Seattle uh, to help co-sponsor that conference. The upshot was that after a, a long period of working together, uh, a delegation of about 50 people from the Northwest and a smaller number from California uh, traveled to Chelyabinsk in May of 1992 to both present and to participate in this uh, rather remarkable meeting. Uh, Jane, maybe you could put yourself in perspective. You were uh, representing the media, I assume? Yes, and, I, uh, I went representing KPBX. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about... Uh, well, it was, it was uh, sort of an incredible experience for me because I never imagined I would ever travel to a place like Russia. And in particular, going to a place like Chelyabinsk where there is, um, it's considered to be the most polluted spot on the planet. And I um, don't necessarily like to subject myself personally <laughs> to those kinds of uh, experiences, but it was a, a very worthwhile trip, I felt, and one which put us in contact with uh, real human beings. I think growing up during the, the age of the Cold War, you know, we have a tendency to look at the Russian people as maybe uh, not good people or evil people, perhaps. And, and it was a delight to me, personally, to find so many folks that were very much like us in the Northwest and wonderful people and a beautiful country, but just unfortunately being faced with incredible uh, consequences from nuclear proliferation and defense production. And Paul, as a downwinder, I guess, as you call yourself, uh, how did you uh, get into the picture and go on this trip? Well, there were many downwinders that were having severe health problems. We could never find the cause. Uh, the doctors, of course, gave us many remedies, so to speak, but the basic cause just wasn't uh, available to us. and. Uh, we had traveled to South America, Europe, and the Middle East, but here was a chance that I could go to Russia and find out what their exposures were, what their health problems were. And so it was, a, it was an adventure that we'll never forget. It was very interesting. I can imagine. Ken? Well, I'm fascinated by the process that this whole conference came about, and I think our audience might be curious, too, about you mentioned that the Russians made the original contact with your PSR group in Seattle, is that correct? Yes, that's right. And I'm wondering, uh, what was the uh, position of the U.S. State Department? Did you have to jump through a lot of hoops? Did you have to get uh, clearance? Did our State Department uh, want to monitor what was going on at this conference? Uh, how open was it? Well, there really were no issues there. If this had happened a number of years ago, I think it would have been quite different. But the, uh, the amazing thing was not any difficulty from our end. The difficulty was still at the Russian end even though this was well into Glasnost and Perestroika, this whole area of Russia was still a closed area until just about uh, four months before we got there. It had been basically closed to foreigners for, you know, 70-some years. And we were only the second delegation of Westerners into this previously closed city. And then, of course, the Mayak production complex about 70 miles away was, was still, uh, still off limits. But that's what created such an amazing dynamic because they were having difficulty internally moving this along. There was immense opposition from the traditional uh, leadership in Russia opposing this kind of sort of spotlight on what were the environmental and health issues that we weren't really aware of until we got there. 
But because uh, there was this broad array of, of scientists, of physicians, of other health professionals and so forth, who had been carrying out all kinds of studies for years, and then comes, a, comes what we consider a, a, a scientific or an environmental congress, they were abs absolutely deluged with people that wanted to be on the program, far beyond anything they were able to accommodate. It was, I mean, it was the first opportunity these folks had had to really share their professional work. And it, we watched sort of democracy in action in ways that were just amazing. Mm. Obviously, this is a unique opportunity. And uh, you said the, the Russians were, were anxious to participate. Must have been, a, of course, very, very gratifying to be selected to go yourself. What, what criteria were put on the number of US uh, participants? Was there any limitation on how many of you could go? No, there wasn't. Uh, PSR uh, coordinated our presenters. And, uh, and having had an opportunity to play a major role in that, my goal was to get people that had been involved in trying to understand our Hanford experience uh, since my time in Spokane and since our work with other activist groups here and bring together those groups both as attendees and, pre and presenters. So we built on people that had been involved in the physician community, the scientific community, people from the media, from the clergy, from uh, other community activist groups and put together uh, about a dozen papers for the, for the program as well as other attendees. And it made a very rich multidisciplinary group, as, of course, my colleagues here can attend to. How many U.S. participants were there? About 50. Mm -hmm. 50 attendees. There were about a dozen uh, presenters on the three-day symposium. Mm -hmm. I know our viewers would be interested to know that later in this program today, and certainly next week, we're going to get into some uh, real facts of what has happened with the uh, the leaks and the radiation and, and some very, very major statistics. But Jane, before we do that, I would like for you to introduce to us an audio that we have put in our system. And in a moment, our staff is going to play a, a segment from that audio. But if you would introduce that about the trip to Russia and uh, just kind of explain the script that they're going to hear. One of the fascinating things about our seven or eight days while we were in Chelyabinsk was we were allowed to go into the Mayak facility. And I don't think we expected that um, before we got to Russia. It was sort of a surprise to us. We were the first citizens uh, really allowed into this facility, um, and except for some Department of Energy officials and, and Secretary of State James Baker from this country. So it was a, uh, an opportunity. And uh, we took a bus into Mayak, and the Russian officials, the Mayak officials, um, were sort of our tour guides. And we, um, I believe the tape begins um, after we've just gone through the gate of the facility, which really isn't a gate at all. There was just a sign, a very innocuous sign, saying danger, radiation. And uh, that surprised us. I expected high security, but it wasn't there. <laughs> and we got off the bus there for a few minutes and then back on and, and were taken to a series of reservoirs. And I believe that's where the tape at this time, we'll ask our staff to run that segment of the tape. ...at Mayak, diverted and dammed the Techa River, creating reservoirs. The water is treated to remove radioactive waste and then sent back into the Techa. Hillary Harding, a citizen activist from Seattle, checks the reading on her handheld radiation detector. It's going from 300 to 400, um, just sort of fluctuating back and forth. Now it's going up to 500. We'll have to switch to 10 times to measure it pretty soon. The bus stops at the land dam, separating two reservoirs. It is a beautiful wetland area with waterfowl and heron. A moose stands in the water, grazing on tall grasses. There is little evidence that people once lived here, except for the skeletal remains of a village church. Oh. <laughs> what are you finding? It's just by with like difference of one step, it shot up 200 counts per minute. What is it? It's about a thousand times background oh, level. Oh, but yeah, but. yeah. How does it feel, Hillary? Did we <laughs> know that you're being irradiated at the present time? Uh, <laughs> Well, I knew it was a possibility. <laughs> it's just bringing it a little closer to reality. Uh, I'm just here, though, on a day trip, and there are people who lived here and even resettled here and then had to move on again. So 
maybe I'm taking my life lightly, but in comparison to what's come before, I feel okay. The people. With that, uh, I know that our viewers got some almost personal contact by hearing the voices and so forth. I would like to proceed with uh, another question or two, Jane, in relation to that. Uh, and I, I will ask uh, Bruce some of these questions too, but there's been such secret uh, guarding of all this whole process. Could you share a little bit with us about uh, how the Russian people found out and uh, what that has meant to this whole study of, of the magnitude of this problem? As far as I know, um, it was only in the last couple of years that some of these um, facts were being revealed to the people. And I'm not sure exactly how the process happened, but uh, I believe it was when radioactivity was being um, detected in the Arctic Ocean and uh, that was traced back down the Techa River, which flows north out of Chelyabinsk, and from this facility um, that there, was, uh, there were radioactive, radioactivity that was detected. I'm not sure exactly how long ago that was, and, and Bruce might be able I, to address that. I would move that. to Bruce in relation to this, yeah. and would you, to our audience today, you were very effective in talking about how it was so secretive in the Soviet Union, but there still was studies and tracking of this, whereas in this country, uh, the tracking and studies didn't take place. I think our viewers would be very interested in that and how that may lead to an understanding of the level of the problem in relation to health and, and to the, this planet. Well. I think every, all of us are aware that, that this work was being carried out, of course, in the context of the early Cold War, uh, beginning in the, in the 40s for both nations, when the, uh, the nuclear arms race was getting fully heated up and when there was this immense competition going on uh, between the Russians and uh, the, the Soviets and ourselves. And what was astounding to us, uh, continues to be astounding, are the parallels. As you talk with them, they saw us as potentially getting nuclear weapons first and they were sacrificing everything for, for to achieve those weapons first and likewise the same thing here I mean it's almost like a mirror image when you when you uh, look at what happened there but the entire effort was carried out in, in uh, under the cloak of national security which is of course has had immense implications that uh, that we're aware of um, basically what what happened in in Russia is that uh, in a in a closed society basically uh, there, there was no probability the public was going to have any awareness of what happened. So their scientists and physicians were actually carrying out very extensive monitoring and studies on populations that were exposed to some of the accidents that we can talk about later, uh, dating back as early as the early 1950s, when large populations were exposed to these off-site uh, uh, releases of, ra of radiation. They have uh, a huge uh, collection now, a uh, huge database on uh, more than 60,000 people that have been monitored, uh, their exposure, their health effects, and so forth, that, that we only became aware of two years ago, and that they acknowledged to the world two years ago. They were able to do this because they, they didn't uh, have to tell anybody, and in fact didn't tell anybody. Gripping stories of physicians who, who, who had absolutely sabotaged their professional ethics by not sharing with people what was happening. On the other hand, if we flip over to the United States, uh, we, uh, we operated, of course, in the same veil of secrecy, and it was only a few years earlier that the first public information occurred, which actually occurred at Hanford, as we know, uh, about uh, some of the environmental and off-site releases from our, our, nuclear, our nuclear weapons production complex. But here, in a so-called open society, uh, we can speculate for the reason that no, study, no studies were done here, that m workers were monitored, but there were no ongoing studies of the public, of the population around our more than a dozen nuclear weapons facilities until right now, until just a couple years ago. Uh, and one can conjecture that, that you don't want to study something that may have to be made public. And so basically nothing was done. So we have no information, uh, scientifically credible information about the public health effects uh, in this country for the off-site population. So the way that the secrecy played out was quite different in the two, in the two countries, mm -hmm. neither of which uh, was very helpful. Uh, or very respectful of the rights of citizens who felt that they were being impacted. Lloyd Marsh. Well, yeah, I can follow. I'd like to follow up on that question and direct it to Paul. Um, have you attempted to uh, contact government agencies and work with government agencies in order to 
resolve some of the questions you have <coughs> about your health issues or the downwinder health issues? And if so, what has been their response? Well, they seem to deny basically all health problems from Hanford. Uh, we have attended a number of their meetings, um, but I don't believe there's been all that much research done on our people regarding health uh, radiation exposure. You haven't yourself been part of a government study to uh, no. you as an individual, or do you know of any individuals that have been studied by the... By there the is a study now of was about three co uh, three counties in the state of Washington that they're making some surveys on but uh, I don't know what the status is on that it's uh, uh, I then I, I might follow up that question with a question to Jane uh, you know we, we depend on our, our public media to be uh, the watchdog of, of things like this uh, do you see any movement in the media the print media or the video media to uh, to investigate and, and further disclose some of this information? Well, I think actually uh, a lot of what happened at Hanford and the release of that information um, can be credited to Karen Dorn Steele from the Spokesman mm -hmm. Review, who was on our trip to Chelyabinsk and um, who has done a tremendous amount of investigative journalism and reporting on this issue and and, and really leaked a lot of, got a lot of information out of what the truth about Hanford is. Um, Karen was on our trip. She's currently working on a book presently about the situation at Hanford. Um, I th believe, uh, you know, we tried at KPBX, the news director, Doug Nedvornik and myself, who went to Russia, you know, we did our best to get a lot of information out and continue to do that in whatever way we can. I do know that there's a, a, another reporter who was a freelance um, radio reporter, Michael O'Rourke from Portland, who was on not part of our trip but just happened to be in Russia, is working on a world security project presently uh, through grants. And I believe he's going to be um, divulging a lot <coughs> of information from his research. And he has produced a series of public radio programs on Hanford and over sort of a retrospective. And uh, I think, you know, as long as Hanford's there, and as long as the problems continue, as long as the waste is there, and we don't have solutions on what to deal, how to deal with it, the media will stay on top of it. Bravo, good. Paul? Heal, Hanford Education Action League out of Spokane, has one or two individuals that uh, do nothing but research and they have helped the downwinders tremendously in searching out truths. I, uh, I would have to congratulate them on their work. Marvelous. They've done fantastic work. Ken Wright. Well, I'm fascinated by this, this whole episode of the opening up of the secrecy, and I think our audience might want to know more about it. There's so many things that I think people would be interested in that having to do with the actual contamination, but let's postpone that just a bit. And I think I'll direct the question to Jane. Tell us just a little bit about HEAL and give us your opinion about where you think we are in the U.S. as far as opening up the, the veil of secrecy that's hung over our nuclear weapons production program. And uh, how many more big revelations do you think there are going to be? Uh, wow. If any. <laughs> that's, uh, a, that's a daunting question. <laughs> Ken, um, as far as locally, I think with our Hanford Education Action League, I think we're very fortunate to have a, an organization that is doing the research and staying on top of the issue. Um, I think it's up to the public, up to the citizens, up to the media, um, whoever is impacted or interested in this issue, to constantly stay on the Department of Energy, um, the various officials to, to try to get the truth. I, I thank God daily for the Freedom of Information Act that mm -hmm. is able to um, get some of that information out. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to me that Hanford, for example, we didn't really know about this until 1986, um, what was really happening there. The 25 years of dumping into the Columbia River, for example, mm -hmm. that was never really revealed. And it's hard to say um, what the Department of Energy is going to to, to present to us down the road. But I, I suspect that concerned people will always be wanting to, to get at the truth and 
I don't know if that answers the question, no, I, but... I suspect that you don't feel then that the uh, Department of Energy and the you know, former AEC has, has come totally clean with the American public yet. I think they're well-meaning people, and I've been to DOE hearings over the years. Um, uh, prior to going to Russia, I was always interested in the, the nuclear issue, living in Idaho with the INEL site down in southeastern Idaho and then this close to Hanford. Um, but I've, I've never really gotten the sense that they are always telling us the complete story. Maybe that's just my paranoia. <laughs> I don't know. But we are uh, close to out of time for this show, and I do want to build a bridge for next week for our viewers. And I'm going to ask Bruce to do that uh, construction for us. We've had a very, very uh, enlightening program, and we've given all the background. I think what we need to do now is to discuss with our viewers specifics of what has happened in relation to the leaks and radiation. And with only about two or three minutes left, Bruce, if you could just inform our viewers for next week, what are some of the sites that we're talking about? Let's identify, for example, in Russia, uh, the accidents, where they were, the time periods, and here. And then next week we'll come back and we'll actually talk about some of the statistics and what kind of impact that could have on this planet that uh, that the misnomer we can uh, clean up that we can really cannot. If you just take a few minutes to identify those for us. Well, in, in Russia, there are a, a series of nuclear production complexes, with Chelyabinsk being the largest, and several more in that, uh, in that area just east of the Urals. Uh, without a map, it probably wouldn't mean much to people. But that's where they were concentrated, because the population was rather sparse, similar to the reason that Hanford was chosen, and water wasn't plentiful supply, and huge amounts are needed for the cooling activities for the, uh, for the uh, we uh, weapons-grade plutonium production. Uh, in the United States, there's <coughs> a... Can I just interrupt say, yes. uh, the accident took place in the 1950s in that area, is that correct? Well, the, uh, there was an accident in 57, there was a major catastrophe in 67, there were production contamination in the mid-40s, so there were a series of things in this, in this particular then, site. Then Chernobyl came on, and we heard more about that. And it's Chernobyl, of course, was, had nothing to do with weapons production. It was a, mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. a power plant that, uh, that exploded. In the United States, there's, a, there's a, 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 again, a geographically very widely dispersed nuclear production complex that includes Oak Ridge and uh, Rocky Flats in Denver and uh, Hanford and uh, South Carolina, uh, New York. These plants uh, had various aspects of the responsibility. I'm and going to have to interrupt. At that point, you have identified those, and I promise our viewers when we come back next week, we'll talk about what's happened at those sites and what it has done to uh, people and the earth and so forth from the, the information you have. Ladies and gentlemen, and I think we have just pl placed before you an intriguing question, that is, what have those accents been? And we'll share those with you next week. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today we welcome you back to part two of this two-part series it's entitled Nuclear Radiation and Leaks that have happened around the world, uh, particularly at uh, different sites that where uh, nuclear uh, 
bombs have been built and so forth, and also, of course, nuclear power plants where there have been some accidents. For you who were not with us last week, we had three guests that have, were very fortunate to have back with us this week, and they laid all the groundwork and the background and identified some of those sites. Our emphasis today is going to be on uh, some of the information that we have about those accidents and leaks and what that has done to those particular areas and to the water tables and the earth and so forth. In order to do that, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the program. Uh, first of all is uh, Mr. Paul Hateful, who is a farmer and was uh, in that business for over 45 years in the Ritzville, Odessa areas of Washington. And he can speak firsthand from uh, his viewpoint of what uh, could happen is what he called a Hanford downwinder. Uh, he indicates that his family has had an unusual number of health problems and he uh, is concerned if that is because of the Hanford nuclear reactor and what might have happened in relation to that. Paul, welcome back to the program. Thank you. And I'm very pleased to have on the program also Jane Fritz, who is a project director, executive producer, and writer for KPBX Public Radio in Spokane. And she recently won the Best Documentary Award from the Inland Northwest Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, and her work has been in many areas, but particularly uh, in this area uh, recently when all of these people who were on our program with others uh, went to Russia to a really a rather amazing conference uh, that dealt with these issues. Uh, she also has done work for the British Broadcasting Corporation and uh, the Christian Science Monitor Radio. Jane, it's a pleasure to have you back for a second week. Thank you, Tony. It's nice and to be here. Our third guest is Dr. Bruce Amiston, who is the, a senior staff scientist for the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center in Seattle. He is a medical doctor. He's had um, many years experience in uh, this whole field, and he's also the co-investigator of the Hanford Thyroid Disease Study and is on the board of directors of a number of health organizations around the country. Uh, Bruce, it's a pleasure to have you back and uh, all of your expertise in this important Thank question. You. And as I'm always, I'm pleased to have two regular panel members. First of all, to my immediate left is Lloyd Marsh, who teaches in the fields of chemistry and physics at North Idaho College, and next to him is Dr. Ken Wright, who is also a chemistry, a chemistry uh, professor at North Idaho College. Uh, usually our panel goes first, but I have chosen to go first today. And, uh, Bruce, my first questions are directed uh, to you. As we ended last week's program, uh, you were identifying some of the sites around the world. Uh, for those who weren't with us, I wish you would do that again. And upon doing that, then, I wish you would share with our uh, viewers some of the statistics that have come forth from some of the measuring of those leaks. And when we talk about things, uh, such as Curie's, and we talk about 10 to 18 being normal and what some of the findings have been. I would greatly appreciate it for our viewers if you could give us some insight to what's happened in what, what we could call contaminated areas around the world. Well, most of the uh, pr production complexes for uh, weapons-grade materials, nuclear materials, have been in the U.S. and the, the former Soviet Union. There are some yes. in France, there are some in England, as we know, China. So it's a, our organization, the International Physicians for Social Responsibility, is currently involved in a major project to document with scientists and physicians around the world where they are and what the state of knowledge is regarding the extent of environmental releases. And that's still very much an unfolding, unfolding information. To try to give our viewers some, some perspective about the enormity of the problem, I think it's worth just sketching out briefly the, what we have learned about the uh, site in Chelyabinsk in Russia, uh, east of the Ural Mountains. Uh, three things happened there very briefly uh, that contributed to their environmental problem. The first was that in the peak of production in the early and late 40s, the mid and late 40s, when they were involved in producing plutonium as quickly as they could, they really had no way to store the, the highly radioactive, most toxic waste, and they simply dispersed them directly into the river, uh, into uh, the Tesha River, which would perhaps be equivalent to the Spokane River in the middle of the summer. I mean, it's more a stream than a river, as we think of the Columbia. Uh, this meant that, that ten dozens of villages along the river that were dependent on the river for cattle, for drinking water, for washing their clothes, for a whole range of things, uh, uh, thousands of individuals were affected before the government notified them and moved some of the villages. Some of the villages further down were never moved. So this, 
I'll get back to amounts in a, se in a minute, but th there were just massive amounts dispersed directly in the river that flowed ultimately into the Arctic Ocean. Secondly, in 57, when they finally got tanks built that would be comparable to the tank farm that we know of at Hanford, massive steel tanks to, to hold the large, the, the most toxic, high-level waste, uh, they have to be continuously cooled because, of course, the radiation is producing heat. The, the uh, cooling system failed in one in 1957, the so-called Kishtim explosion and about 20 million curies of radioactivity were dispersed into the air, first into the water, then into the air, contaminating some 20 to 30,000 square miles of agricultural land and another 200 and some towns and villages. And then, in order to try to stop the continuing flow of this radioactive material that had settled into the sediments of the Tesha River, they built a series of dams and diverted the river. And I think they have nine or 10, they call them ponds, they're lakes. They're huge, they're miles long. And uh, one of those, one reservoir, the Karachi Reservoir, dried up in 67 in a, in a very warm spring. And all of this radioactive material was part of the sediment and the dirt. The spring winds came along and dispersed them again widely to the north and west. So that, that they've acknowledged the uh, release off-site from this uh, Mayak complex of something in the range of 150 to 160 million curies of radioactivity. Now, what does a curie mean? Well, uh, one curie of radioactive energy and, and disintegration is a, uh, is a, is a huge amount. Uh, in Chernobyl, uh, the, the biggest single dispersal of radioactive material, it's estimated that that uh, released about 100 million curies. Uh, unprecedented, of course, and we know what that did across a vast range of Western Russia and Europe. But uh, we got concerned here when with the Three Mile Island accident, there was release of what may have been 10 or 20 curies, 10 or 20, compared with 150 or 160 million. So that they have a problem of such magnitude that it's really unprecedented on the face of the globe. Can I interject something here too from some research that I did prior to the program at Chernobyl? Uh, some of those uh, problems can uh, be magnified more as other things are developing. The research indicated that they had 800 holes they dug to bury um, what uh, was a rather large amount, uh, of course, the contaminated material, mm -hmm. and those are supposed to be just temporary, but where do they put them and where do they get the money to that? But the, the other disturbing factor is that over half of the contaminated material is in the plant itself, which they concreted over, and now it is sinking, according to the latest reports, and is going into the water level. So do I understand that even though what you're talking about is what's already been released, there are other possibilities of uh, further problems as, as these kind of things happen? Well, there are, because the, uh, the waste disposal over the roughly 50 years of the nuclear age has always been temporary. We still don't have a permanent solution, as we know from the continuing debate about the permanent repository. But if we look at, at Hanford, for example, or if we look at Savannah River, where, uh, where the waste were allowed to, basically the soil has become the major repository for liquid waste. And the soil at, at Hanford is sandy and it's been percolated and is percolating down into the groundwater. And the EPA has estimated approximately 25,000 square miles of groundwater contaminated from Hanford. At Savannah River, they actively pumped into the ground. They had reverse wells. They pumped it into the ground. And that together with huge quantities of mercury and, and, and a range of other toxic materials that are part of the weapons production process have also been, the soil has also been used, the ground, as the major repository. And, and, and we have no good way of, of, of extracting, let alone stabilizing that now in some sites, although there's immense amount of work going on, to talk rather blandly about, um, about uh, recovering the wastes uh, is really quite misleading when you're talking about the magnitude of the examples that we're, we're, we're talking about here. Lord Marsh. Yeah, yeah, I'd just like to follow up on that. Uh, you did make a comment this morning about um, the, the length of time that we have to deal with this. Some radioactive elements, of course, have a short, short half-life, as we talk mm -hmm. about uh, a time when it takes it to disintegrate to half its original amount. But talk about a little bit about the, the enormous problem what we're dealing with with long half-lives. How do you clean this up? Well, this is the major challenge, I think, to the environmental and scientific the political community. Uh, plutonium, as, as you indicated, uh, is, is a good example. That's been the end product. And we know that there are, there are literally tons of plutonium that, have been, uh, that are part of the waste stream uh, in these various sites. Plutonium has a half-life of 24,000 years, which means it basically is with us indefinitely. The uranium uh, family, 
from which plutonium is derived tends to have a half-life, many of which are even longer than this. So some of it is, is uh, disappearing at a rapid rate, some of the other radioisotopes. But we have, we have substances that basically are here forever, for which we have no way yet of, uh, of sequestering from the environment. Well, that's the problem. Ken Wright. Well, this is a bit speculative, but let's not deal just with facts <coughs> on this program. Uh, I don't want to pass up this opportunity to get your opinion on something. So I'm curious which of our U.S. nuclear installations do you feel or suspect has the worst environmental contamination from either on-site or off-site nuclear releases? Uh, there's a lot of information we don't have yet. Uh, in many respects, Hanford clearly fits that bill. Hanford is the largest. It was the site, the m most important site for plutonium production, Savannah River in, in Carolina being the other. But we know that, that Hanford contains about two-thirds of the high-level liquid wastes in the tank farm in the total U.S. production complex. Okay. In terms of off-site releases, we simply don't know that. We're, we're just beginning to do dose reconstruction studies, the first one going on at Hanford, to try to get a sense from the production data what the total releases would have been off-site. We're beginning to get some handle at Hanford. It's going to be somewhere in the several millions. We know that radioactive iodine, the study that I'm involved in, there was something over 800,000 curies of radioactive iodine released into the environment, which is, a, uh, of course, a massive amount. But the, the total releases to the Columbia River and so forth is something that the Dose Reconstruction Project is still trying to get a handle on. But if we, if we can put that in comparison to the Chelyabinsk site that we're talking about here, it, it may be several million curies of radioactivity versus 150 or 60 or 80 million. So we get some idea of the magnitude. However important this is for us, we see what this other area of the globe is facing compared with our situation here with far fewer resources to come to grips with it, of course. I have a question for Paul and Jane both. Uh, first of all, Paul, uh, in your presentation when you also indicated that uh, even though you're not a scientist and all that things were happening uh, on your farm that you were wondering about, and would you share with the viewers uh, the, the so-called weather balloons and, and the wind currents and how you think that uh, uh, was a factor in uh, creating concern for you? Yes, in the uh, <coughs> latter 50s, early 60s, we found three weather balloons on our grounds, and uh, they had transmitters. And they were called weather balloons, and Hanford wanted us to return them to the original site where they were released. But there was more than that to them. I believe they were indicating to Hanford where the wind currents were taking the fumes from Hanford. Mm -hmm. um, what was your, and then we had, uh, many times where we had a metallic taste in our mouth. I know the children, they remarked about it every once in a while. And we live uh, approximately 55 miles downwind from Hanford. And then when the wind would change, say, straight west, we would get the, the uh, sort of a pungent sweet odor from the UNI Sugar Factory in Moses Lake, which is about 35 miles away. So we have an indication here how the wind would uh, bring these things to our area. Jane, I would like to go back to Russia with you for a minute. And, and again, uh, you have explained earlier today to our audience about uh, areas that are just desolate now uh, because of the leaks and accidents. And could you tell us a little your personal experience as you looked into one village and the, only the church is left? And the, there must be something very serious or areas would not be um, the whole populations moved from those areas. Would you share that with our viewers? The, the place we went to visit, the reservoirs that we visited um, that were very highly radioactive, um, were we had handheld radiation detectors. And we were getting counts of 1,000 to 2,000, um, and I believe they're rads. I'm not exactly sure exactly the measurement, um, the radioactivity measurement. But the background level, we were told, was about um, 18 for that area, should have been 18, and we were getting 1,000 to 2,000. Mm. And it was an incredible place of beauty. Um, it was a wetland. We, when we came up on the bus, there was a uh, heron and waterfowl, a moose, 
actually standing in part of the marsh. Um, but you could tell that people lived there once because of this church that was standing. The people that were removed to that area, um, and my understanding is that they came back and were moved again, uh, and I've been told that a lot of the agricultural land that was vacated, the people are returning and are using the land again. The, the particular um, isotopes that were released in that area are strontium-90 and cesium-137, which both have a half-life, I believe, of a, around 30 to 40 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm not sure when those villages actually were moved, but the feeling is after a period of time that soil will be able to be used again. How much contamination there is on those agricultural lands from um, plutonium and other elements, I'm not, you know, I have no idea. But it was, a, it, it, it was sort of a, an eerie feeling. You asked my feelings about it. Uh, it's invisible. You don't realize, unless you're standing there with this radiation device that's mm -hmm. telling you that it's very highly radioactive, that you're being exposed to anything. Because so. you can't feel it. You don't know what's going well, on. I, I talk about the power. One quick thing that you bring to mind is so many things that are dangerous, we can smell it or mm -hmm. see it and so forth. This would be much better if we could when it would have created a, an alarm much earlier. Right. Yep. Right. Lloyd Marsh. I'd like to address this question to Bruce. You referred to earlier about the biomedical studies that have been done in Russia. And could you fill us in a little bit about the, the comparison of the results that they have, maybe, or data that they have, and what we have, and how you're cooperating with them to investigate this? Well, one of the real problems, Lloyd, is that we have almost nothing yet. The Russians had been uh, monitoring uh, tens of thousands of people for some time, but they just published their first result showing an adverse health effect uh, just a couple, just w about two months ago. Wow. It showed an increase in leukemia, a modest increase in leukemia in some of the people along the Tesha River. That's the first uh, epidemiologic study to come from their data. Uh, in, in our case, as I think uh, we mentioned in the popcorn form, uh, we didn't do any studies on anything but workers. There was no monitoring or health studies on populations around these plants until the first one was finally funded for Hanford because of pressure from people here and through our congressional delegation. And the Hanford Thyroid Disease Study, which I'm participating in, is the first independent study of off-site populations around any facility in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And we are several years from having that completed. So you see, that one of the real problems here uh, is that we don't have any good, solid scientific information that there have been health problems in either place because it hasn't been studied. And lots of people feel there have been problems, and it's certainly plausible when you talk to our Russian colleagues based on what we see in some of the villages and so forth. But uh, we simply don't have, we don't have the results yet to, trans to translate the environmental contamination and the exposure to actual uh, health problems from a scientific basis. And those studies are very difficult to do for low-dose radiation, and they're even more difficult now that we're uh, 30 or 40 years past some of the major exposures that people experienced. So that's, I think, quite unconscionable on the, part of the, on the part of the government that those were not done concurrently, uh, as at least they were in Russia, even though, of course, people didn't benefit from them and weren't informed. But we are, in fact, uh, working with the Russians now and, and expect to, to have an opportunity to analyze their data in the future? Yeah, I think their data will be, be immensely important. You see, there's, there are very little understanding yet of the, bio, of the health effects of low levels versus right. all of it's come from Nagasaki and Hiroshima and major accidents. Right not what's happening at low levels of exposure. So this information on 60 or 65,000 people uh, I think is going to be immensely important to the world uh, because it, it will probably never be repeated again. Mm -hmm. But it's just beginning to be analyzed. Mm -hmm. Ken Wright. Well, you've already answered one of my questions partially because I was going to ask you about the, uh, you know, why did we do, you know, wait so long to do studies in this country? And you've, you've explained some of that. Uh, how difficult uh, have we made it to, to get a valid study because we waited so long <coughs> in doing any studies? Uh, we, people are dying that, uh, that could be interviewed and from which we get some valid health information. And usually the death certificates do not give you a, a very accurate description of what their yeah. causes were, causative factors. Well, I think we've made it immensely difficult because the biggest exposures in this country came during the early years when, when there was the least attention or the right. poorest technology to contain these elements on site. Uh, just to give you an example, with the thyroid study, 
in order to really determine whether there is more thyroid disease, we decided we have to go back and find the people that were exposed during the early years when they were the youngest, when they'd be the greatest risk. And so we are actually in, involved, we selected a sample, we are tracing people who were born between 1942 and 1947 in the counties uh, around the site, tracing them, trying to get their permission to participate, bringing them together and doing clinics. And, and, these, and these are people that, um, that were exposed almost 45 to 50 years ago. Right. This kind of a study has never been done successfully before, and yet that's the challenge that faces us now to re try to recreate this history if we're really going to get accurate results. The, the cost, of course, has got to be very high. Oh, uh, is, is the funding available? Does it look like it's going to become available to do really good studies? Well, the funding is, is, is adequate for the studies that are funded, but, and they're just getting started in other facilities like INL in Idaho and Rocky Flats and so forth, but uh, the funding clearly is going to be a limiting factor in a time when funding is short for everything. It's going to be crippling. Paul, you had a comment you want to make in relation to that? Well, the same thought occurred to me that why haven't these studies been done many years ago? The scientists knew that we were having tremendous radiation leakage over this area. We know that from the Green Run papers. I think uh, Congress did a wonderful thing when they passed that act where the, what they call the Freedom of Information Act, and this is how we received a lot of the information on the Green Run. And uh, this indicates to us that uh, the government could have done a lot of research many years ago, and it was not. Bruce, I have a question, and you really triggered this thinking, both in your comments to the audience and on the program here. Then I'll, I'll tell our viewers we're taping this in February because it won't air until a later time, and mm -hmm. that'll make some time changes on some of these studies you've talked about. But I was doing a little research uh, as a layperson, totally ignorant in this area, and, and from that research we uh, found that uh, the reports that in the Hanford area that badgers and ground squirrels and others have been able to dig through and, 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 and some of these burials where after the salt and they've gone and brought it out, those animals and, the, and their droppings, uh, according to these reports, are over a 2,500 acre area and that that's created some type of radiation in those areas. And also the study revealed that over 11 million gallons of radioactive waste at, uh, uh, way back in the 1950s were deposited in, and through the injection into the aquifer that it's moving and it's uh, uh, going further each year. So my long question to you is that from all of this being there and obviously for many, many thousands of years, to what extent do we have data to indicate that it may just continue to spread and spread to a much, much larger area? And certainly in Russia where the contamination has been with, with these mind-boggling statistics, I mean, how much of the planet can be affected by this whole problem? Um, Dr. Yablokov, who is the environmental advisor to uh, Yeltsin in Russia, has identified the, the contamination of the Soviet Union with radioactive materials as their number one environmental problem. And he's offered a statistic, and I'm not sure how he's borne that out. He has suggested that 15% of the land mass of Russia may be unfit for human habitation. Now, that is a massive country, and I have no idea how he came up with that. It gives you some idea of how the scientific community is beginning to view the magnitude of the legacy of the nuclear arms race. We cannot contain the aquifers under Hanford. That is, that is one of the challenges that the environmental community is now, is now trying to come to grips with. But aquifers continue to move, and the volumes are prodigious, and as I suggested, the acreage is huge, and the public, even in this state, does not have a sense of the magnitude of this problem environmentally and the fact that it is not <laughs> simply solvable. It's not even containable at this point. It just moves. Yeah. Uh, in relation to that too, when you were talking about one of the rivers in Russia, and I don't recall which one now, uh, when one talks about cleanup, which is a really poor term to use, would you give our viewers the example of how many miles you're talking about and even if you could go in there, what, what are you talking about? Well, just the example of the Tesha River, the Tesha River runs for hundreds of miles, wanders through the Siberian Plain, and as Jane indicated, ends up in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the sediment, the, 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 the prodigious amounts of radioactivity settle into the sediments uh, in ever decreasing amounts, of course, but it continued to be, and continue now, to be washed along in the river bottom. Uh, we don't 
have the resources, let alone the Russians, to dredge and somehow contain, you know, hundreds of miles of river bottom. Th that would be an example of the challenge that faces it. They have a dam holding back a massive lake that is channeling, that some of our people saw. It's, it's, it's undermining. And if that gives way, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lake that's miles long that contains highly radioactive waste, wa waste that are contaminated enough that if you spend for more than a few hours on the bank of the river, you could obtain a lethal dose. They're grappling now with how they can contain that. There's a major international effort <coughs> to try to uh, re-stabilize re, uh, that earthen dam. I, I almost get the impression from you that of all the political issues and problems that we have, and some can be addressed, budgets and so forth, uh, this is one that's just uh, taken control, and it's not one of those that you can, s what we call, sweep under the political rug. Uh, there's no question about that. We can't sweep it under the environmental rug either. Mm -hmm. Jane, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I also want to get back to you concerning your visits to the hospitals. And I know mm -hmm. from what the doctor said that we don't have all uh, the data in, you know, about the health and so forth, but what did you find when you visited the hospitals and what were the opinions of the people? Well, from an anecdotal standpoint, um, we found um, a lot of sick children, a lot of leukemia. Um, we found, um, I went and visited in, in Kishtim, uh, the, the community where the explosion happened in 1957, I was fortunate enough to interview a midwife uh, at the maternity ward in the hospital and, and a couple of young mothers. And this midwife had been there at the hospital for 30 years. And I asked her, you know, what kind of things has she seen? Has she seen a change? And, and she admitted that the, the babies that are born are, are coming a little earlier, more premature births, and that there are um, a lot of lethargy among the young children, that there isn't the vitality. And uh, I know in, in one of the villages, uh, we didn't get a chance to visit it, Bruce and I, but Paul did in Muslimova, um, of hearing of stories of how the children in the schools um, don't have very good muscle control for simple things like holding a pencil. With that, I have to bring a permanent conclusion. I'm sorry to have to interrupt this <laughs> point. It's a topic that needs more attention. I want to thank all mm -hmm. three panel members, uh, all three guests and the two panel members for two weeks of a most serious and important topic. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we just simply scratched the surface in dealing with what we call nuclear production sites and leaks and accidents that have taken place. And I'm sure you have found this most informative and I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week when we'll discuss another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.